With this lesson, we'll begin our studies of protein function in Chapter 5. In this chapter, we'll be considering a series of proteins and relate their structure to their biological functions. We're going to begin with the study of the oxygen-binding proteins myoglobin and hemoglobin, and in this lesson, we'll be looking specifically at that oxygen-binding core. Let's do a brief overview of the chapter. After considering these binding proteins, we'll next look at some structural proteins, and we'll see these relate to the shape of the cell, but in some cases movement is possible. In other words, it can be dynamic. Lastly, we'll consider some rather impressive motor proteins, which can convert chemical energy into physical movement. Note that in each of these cases, these are non-catalytic proteins. For the catalytic proteins, or enzymes, we'll consider those in chapters 6 and 7. We might first ask ourselves, why are we considering myoglobin and hemoglobin? First of all, we know a great deal about them, and they're certainly critical for life in their role as oxygen transporters. There's also a medical significance in that a mutation in the hemoglobin gene can lead to disease, sickle cell anemia. In the upper right, we see an illustration, a picture of a sickled red blood cell. More fundamentally, though, once we understand the oxygen binding properties of myoglobin and hemoglobin, we learn some general characteristics and some fundamental principles that are widely applicable in many areas of biochemistry, and so it will serve us well in our future studies. Let's look at that oxygen binding core. First, I'd like to focus your attention on the structure of myoglobin. That's our ribbon diagram in gray on the left. Remember, this is a monomer. As you can see, the secondary structure is primarily alpha helical, and the helices are labeled according to their position within the chain. So here's our N terminus here, our first helix is A, our second is B, and so forth, until we get to that last H helix, our eighth helix, and there's our C terminus here. Now if we compare that with the structure of hemoglobin on the right, we see a very similar structure. Keep in mind, hemoglobin is a tetramer, and so we're only looking at one of its subunits here. It also is primarily alpha helical. It has eight alpha helices arranged in a similar way, and we'll compare these in a little bit more detail in a later video. I should point out that in this figure from the web, I took my best educated guess on labeling those helices, but I'm pretty sure it's right. At least you can see the structure is very similar. The next thing I'd point out is the presence of that heme group. You can see the purple molecule on the left and the green on the right. Not surprising, I suppose, that myoglobin and hemoglobin are so similar in structure and carry the same heme group because they have the same function, that is to carry oxygen. We'll see their roles differ though, and we'll want to look at that in a later video. We call this a prosthetic group. That's because it's added after the protein is synthesized, just as we might have a prosthetic limb that's added after, and yet we need that for function. And so the heme group is always present. It's actually the heme group that's carrying that oxygen. I would point out one more thing on this slide, and that is the relative orientation of that heme group in myoglobin. You'll notice a portion of that is more buried within the protein, and the portion at the top here is more solvent exposed. Let's look a little bit more closely at that ring structure. So here's the heme group, heme group in the bottom right. It's called a porphyrin ring. It has an alternating series of double, single and double bonds, and you can see a high degree of resonance, and for this reason it's highly colored. In fact, the name porphyrin means purple. When we synthesize it in the lab, you can see it is indeed a purple compound, so that's a very good name for it. There are several proteins that ha carry heme groups and have this porphyrin ring, and the substituent groups might vary. In this case, at the top, we have po polar propionate groups, and those are at the top of the screen here in our box of blue. Those are the more solvent-exposed portion that we saw in the previous slide. And then we have nonpolar vinyl groups in our boxes of green, and those are more buried within the protein. So not only is the heme important for function, but its orientation within the protein is also vital to its function. Now we'll notice in the center of that ring is our iron atom. That's the specific atom that's carrying the oxygen, as we'll see. Notice that it's coordinated to the four nitrogens within the center of that porphyrin ring. It is specifically ferrous, or iron-2, that has to carry the oxygen. Let's look more closely at the positioning of that ring within the protein. So here's our heme ring 
on the right, and remember there are four nitrogens coordinated to that central iron. In the figure on the left, all of the nitrogen atoms are in blue, oxygen are in red, and there's our iron in purple. So there's our four nitrogens within the plane of the ring. We find there's a fifth coordination, and that's to a nitrogen in a histidine residue. It's located in helix F at position 8, and so we call that histidine F8. And so in all cases, there are at least these five coordinations, five nitrogens coordinated to that central iron. In the presence of oxygen, as illustrated here, there's a sixth coordination. It's actually a hydrogen bond with uh, another histidine residue located in helix E at position 7, so we call that histidine E7. Notice that hydrogen bond, the dashed highlighted line, that's our hydrogen bond. You'll notice the histidine F8 is close enough to make direct contact with that iron atom, and so it's the proximal histidine. It's in close proximity to that porphyrin ring. In contrast, we have histidine E7. It's further away. It's a further distance, and so that's the distal histidine. Notice it can only make contact, form that hydrogen bond, in the presence of oxygen. Heme by itself is actually not a very good oxygen carrier, and that's because that central iron atom can get oxidized to iron 3, and that does not make a good carrier. And so here's why we need that heme ring to be buried within the protein in this protected cleft in both myoglobin and hemoglobin. In our next lesson, we want to consider how we could measure the binding affinity of these two proteins for oxygen. How do they compare? And we want to look at some general principles for how we can determine binding uh, affinities for any type of biological molecule.